and that brings to a close this program just to mention Andy Murray is up in uh, the fourth set in uh, the match currently at the Australian Open he's 2-1 up in the fourth set and he's two sets to one up so far if you're watching on BBC One join them for their special celebration of 40 years of breakfast TV I'll be back if you're watching us here on BBC World News do stay with us Hello again. I'm sure you'd agree it's been a very bitter start to the new working week. Good morning. Welcome to Tuesday here on BBC One. It's time now for breakfast. Hello, good morning, welcome to Breakfast with Sally Nugent and John Kay. Our headlines today, the Met Police is investigating 800 of its own officers over sexual and domestic abuse claims after a serving constable admitted 49 offences, including dozens of rapes. Teachers in England and Wales are set to strike over seven days in February and March in a dispute over pay. A row erupts between the UK and Scottish governments after Westminster announced plans to block the Gender Recognition Reform Bill passed by Holyrood last month. While rising prices are still racing ahead of wages, good morning as inflation continues to leave most of us worse off, we're speaking with businesses struggling with rising costs and recruitment. In sport this morning, how Andy's conjured some of that old Murray magic in his opening match at the Australian Open. Good morning. Once again, it is a cold and a frosty start to the day. There's a risk of ice on untreated surfaces, but for many of us, it will be dry with some winter sunshine. However, there's snow in the forecast, and I'll tell you where later in the programme. People say, television on in the morning? That's disgusting. Disgusting idea. What's happening in this country? People even use the word immoral. But we're still here. Uh, 40 years on, we're celebrating a special birthday on the programme this morning and we'll be taking a few trips down memory lane. Good morning. It is Tuesday the 17th of January. The Metropolitan Police Force is investigating a thousand allegations of abuse involving around 800 of its own officers. This comes after PC David Carrick pleaded guilty to 49 offences, including dozens of rapes, the worst ever case of a serving police officer. The Met Police Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, apologised to Carrick's victims for the failure of the force, as Francis Reid reports. More people deciding to return to work is good news for employers like David, who we just met. But what David would like to see, what most of us would like to see, is costs coming down. Now, if that happens, and this morning the Chancellor has reiterated his pledge to half inflation this year, then these competitive wage rises mean that real pay, so that's how far your money actually goes, will start to look a little bit healthier sooner but John and Sally there are so many ifs before we see that happening and more importantly feel it happening that trickle down to how we feel at home and how much we can spend it's really hard to predict isn't it it is I mean the fact that the raw price of energy wholesale energy prices is set to come down this year we hope will have an impact on absolutely everything but there's going to be a lag before we feel that at home Nina thank you nearly half past eight we're about to have a birthday party so make a cup of tea uh, and join us uh, as we literally turn back the clock <laughs> keep the clock that's what keep we the clock do. time now though to get the news the travel and weather where you are we'll see you in a second Hello, 
Good morning. Don't worry, you haven't missed 40 years and something's <laughs> gone wrong. Uh, we're celebrating 40 years today since the first edition of Breakfast Today with Sally Nugent and John Kay. Yes, the 17th of January 1983 saw the very first Breakfast Time programme marking the arrival of Breakfast Television on our screens. And one of those people still involved in the programme today who was involved back in 1983 behind the scenes, Carol! I have to say I was two. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Work experience. <laughs> it yeah. certainly was. But I joined when I was a student in the summer of 1983. I was a production secretary. And it was so exciting because I always wanted to work for the BBC. And I was here. Or I was in Lime Grove in London. But <laughs> I was in the studio. All my dreams were coming true. What, when you say you're a production secretary, what, was that, what does that mean? What did you actually do? Well, I used to type scripts and we used to use carbon paper. Do you remember that? It was like tissue paper. You'd have six pieces in there. If you made a mistake, you had your rubber trying to get it out. <laughs> the paper would be going up and down. You made mistakes. Nightmare. <laughs> all the time, John, all the time. <laughs> Never. But the other thing, we used to phone some of the presenters to wake them up. So they got an alarm call from us. And I remember one time phoning Frank Boff. And the phone was answered really quickly. And it wasn't Frank, it was his son. And he said, oh, please call back. Dad will kill me. I've been at a party. I should have been there at midnight. So I did. And Frank was none the wiser. But, you know, we used to book taxis. We, we did everything. It was just brilliant. And auto queue. You'd be glad that I'm not doing your auto queue today. Oh, I don't know. That could be quite fun, couldn't it? A bit of jeopardy in the, in the programme. It's so lovely to have you here oh, on this special birthday. Thank and you. you're going to be doing the weather with Francis, Francis. the original weatherman. Yes. yes. Live, shortly. Super excited. OK, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Well, also, later in the programme, we will be joined by some other very special guests. They'll be here on the sofa helping us celebrate there's francis this. the weatherman with his weather jumper on uh, also next to him debbie ricks who was the show's very first newsreader and there's russell grant breakfast times astrologer they're having a lovely catch-up aren't they over a oh, cup of tea they're gonna come and join us on our sofa in just a minute <laughs> can't wait for that i'm hoping russell will tell us what's going to happen this year yeah i think he will that'd be useful that would yes, be useful i'd like to know what do you remember about that first because we were teenagers what, yeah what do you remember I think I remember, was I a teenager? Maybe only just um, getting ready for school. It was really cold and I remember coming down early, putting the TV on and thinking it was just the strangest thing ever. Because we'd never, they'd never been telly yeah. before lunchtime <laughs> that at that makes time. makes sound so old. Three channels, nothing on till lunchtime. Do you want to see something really embarrassing? I, I'm always kind of embarrassed to share this. this no, you're is, not. You're not is, embarrassed at all. You love it. This is the secret diary of Jonathan K, aged 13 and three quarters. The actual diary, I found this at my dad's house a few weeks ago. And I didn't keep it for very long, but on the 17th of January, 1983, I actually wrote in it, look, Monday, today I woke up at 6 a.m. to watch the most publicised breakfast TV. And I talk about how weird it was to be eating cornflakes watching it. So that was, that was written exactly 40 years ago today? 40 years ago today. Now, I notice it's a five-year diary, but there's only about four entries in it. Yeah, and you're not reading any of the others. That's the <laughs> only don't, one that's, uh, that's going public. But I thought I'd use that as a way of catching up with some of the other people who were involved in that very first team uh, sitting on the very first sofa. Phil Collins was number one. We had pound notes, not pound coins. And 13-year-old me crept downstairs. This is BBC One. To watch a bit of TV history. Breakfast time. It's 6.30, Monday, January the 17th. 1983. You're watching the first edition of BBC Television's Breakfast Time, Britain's first ever regular early morning television programme. Letters and telegrams have been pouring into our offices here, wishing us luck with breakfast time. And just like Adrian Mole, who was also 13 at the time, I wrote about it in my diary. Our first look at Monday's main stories. Dear diary, Today I woke up at 6am to watch the most publicised and now criticised breakfast TV. It was good, but all news! It's just coming up to a quarter to seven. Imagine eating cornflakes while watching Mr Boff. Looking back now, it wasn't all news. Cardboard <laughs> cutter. The Harry Sticker that was. The content was varied, to put it mildly. You've turned up looking absolutely gorgeous. Bend like this. A mix unlike anything we'd seen on TV before. Stretch. 
stretch out, expanding the lungs. First time for years I've been up this time in the morning. Three planets moving from the sign of Sagittarius. Look out! Means you're going. <laughs> and all presented from a red sofa. That first programme was produced not in Salford, where we make breakfast today, but at Lime Grove in West London, which was also home to Grandstand, Panorama and even Doctor Who. Somebody's nicked the ruddy plaque. It's at least the last remnant of breakfast time and the BBC. 40 years after he presented the very first show, Nick Ross has brought me back. Good morning to you. We really have been astonished at the goodwill and the good wishes we've received. That's where the breakfast time studio was. As I recall, the first floor, I can't remember. You had to go upstairs. It was such a warren, I can't even remember. And then you suddenly went into this a magical space. When you were sitting there on the sofa, did you get a sense of who was watching? How many people were watching? What was... We didn't know if anyone was watching, John. I mean, you know. <laughs> and of course, it was a fantastic hit right from the very start. How confident are you that you are going to be Prime Minister by the well, end of this year? Well, I think year? we've got every chance of doing it. Of course, we've got a lot of work to do. And you weren't wearing a tie. Nobody mentioned it. It didn't matter because the, the news itself was good enough or the stories were so powerful. It doesn't matter whether you're wearing a tie or not. That's absolutely irrelevant. So you reckon I should be taking my tie off? Charlie should be taking his tie absolutely. off? Absolutely. Oh, interesting. I'll tell the boss. I'm not sure what we have to say. <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted that you've still got a red sofa. I mean, it's not the original, but at least you've still got the red sofa. But where is the original? What happened to that red leather sofa? It must be somewhere. Well, I suspect it's junked. <laughs> It's pretty ancient. I don't think it survived. I think I might know somebody who can tell us. One of the young production secretaries who was working on the programme in those early days is still working on Breakfast Today, and she knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. It was so exciting because I had always wanted to work for the BBC, and here I was on breakfast time. You know, it was revolutionary, it was new. Well, let me put a summary of all that so you can read at your leisure. Up the top, it's horrible. In the west, it's dull. In the east, it's quite nice. These days, in the gallery, there's loads of computers, lots of stuff is automated. But when you were doing the job, you were doing the timings literally with, with stopwatches in your hand. That's right, there were two. And you're looking at these watches and you'll have the director saying, how long left in this item? How long left in the programme? Like, ah! How stressful was that? I can't it imagine. Was, it was, but it focused you. And when you brought the programme out on time at the end, it's like, yes! And when you didn't? It was, oh no! <laughs> Francis, you haven't mentioned Northern Ireland. Oh, sorry. Very cross. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So. I am sorry, do apologise. Do you have any idea what happened to that original red leather sofa? I'm trying to find it. Do you know, I think some of it was thrown away, but I think some of it may have been auctioned for children in need. Ah, but as okay. for the rest, I don't know. It must be somewhere. It must it be must somewhere. Be. You haven't got it. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> so I did what would have seemed unthinkable back in 1983. I put an appeal on social media. I think it's a cracker. One of our early presenters, Fern Britton, replied, saying she remembered the sofa that the leather was embarrassingly squeaky, but she didn't know where it was. Jeremy Bowen also reminisced about the sofa he sat on 20 years ago, but he didn't know where to find the original. One viewer could tell me the make and model, but then the trail went cold, until a tip-off. John, I think Debbie Greenwood actually has the red sofa. Debbie Greenwood? <laughs> More the great classical roles, or do you enjoy... Debbie Greenwood, the former Miss United Kingdom who presented the programme in the mid-1980s. Hello. Hello. Debbie Greenwood. I have reason to believe you may be in possession of the original BBC Breakfast Time red leather sofa. Guilty as charged, I'm afraid. You have got it. I do have a bit of it, yeah. Can we small see it? A bit of it. Yeah, come in. Uh, come yes. <laughs> I got it because it was a leaving present from the BBC. And you know, they've always been a bit mean. <laughs> there it is. What do you think? It's small. <laughs> but, but we've got it. We've got it, haven't we? Do you want to try it out? I'd love to. Have a seat. Sitting on the original BBC breakfast television sofa. <laughs> much softer than the one we have today. It's very soft and it's a good job. 
you're not wearing leather trousers because it has a tendency to make some quite <laughs> funny noises when you're wearing leather trousers. I don't intend to wear leather trousers. Why did you want this as a leaving present? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather have had a diamond ring, but that's what they gave me. <laughs> But what does it mean to you now? <laughs> it means a lot to me because heads of state, film stars, everybody's been on there. Uh, because at that time, and I'm sure still the case now, it was a go-to. Well, we are keeping strange yeah. company in a way, but more about that later. Well, I just gag it. Please tell me that sometimes you come and sit on the original sofa and watch BBC Breakfast today. Of course I do. Of course I do. Really? Yeah, I do. Would you ever get rid of it? No. No, 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 no. Never, ever, ever, ever. So, 40 years after the programme launched... Oh, my God! <laughs> ...and we first watched TV in the morning, the sofa that set the tone for breakfast. We found it! You found it? We found it, yeah. Detective John, well oh, done. Oh, thank goodness we found it. I love the fact that Debbie Greenwood is sitting on it this morning, morning watching Debbie. this programme. Debbie is now a wedding celebrant in London, okay. but she is celebrating this programme today. Cheers, Debbie, with a breakfast time cup. Lovely to see you and lovely to meet you. We are joined now on our sofa by two very special guests who can give us a unique insight into what breakfast TV was like 40 <laughs> years ago on that other sofa. Yes. Debbie Ricks, Breakfast Time's first newsreader. Russell Grant, the show's astrologer. Morning. Very morning. good morning to you. Thank you so much for coming in. Debbie, what do you think of our sofa compared well, to your sofa? It's just as uncomfortable, really. It's <laughs> dreadful, isn't it? <laughs> it really. Tell everyone at home. It's there is dreadful. something about studio set designers that they simply they design it to look groovy, but nobody ever thinks about who's got... You must spend half your life sitting on this thing. Yeah. Do you have a back problem? Always. Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the one we tried in Debbie's house was very, very squishy. Very this squishy. one is the opposite problem. Yes. It's like a, yes. a plank. You're but it's more like Velcro. Forward. It sticks you to it. <laughs> so that no one is going to end up on the floor like we used to with no, that no. leather thing. Did you slide, slide off it? Yes. Yeah, oh, many times. Did on you? the very first show, a lovely Harry Seacombe, um, who I was doing some stars for, um, I came in, saw the back of his head one minute, the next minute he disappeared. Where's he gone? He had slid off the sofa and people were trying to haul Harry up Poor back Harry. into his place. Lovely man. Uh, extra problem for you is that you are extra slippery because of your jumper collection. Well, there's a story about that. Sure. I mean, I have got the only one that's left, which was sent to me by Karen Wright, because she knows that I support Middlesex County Cricket Club, so she did that. I kept it because it's a bit blingy, and since Strictly, I've gone very blingy. Lovely. And um, uh, I had over a hundred of them. People used to send them in. And that very first show, I was actually dapper in a waistcoat. <gasps> yes. Do you remember? Right, yes. And our wonderful, wonderful editor, Ron Neal, the sweet, sweetest, kindest man, walked in through that mohair jumper at me and said, put that on, you're now like entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> I went, I'm in news and current affairs. <laughs> Just wear it, and that was that. And you that didn't then, argue, did you? They came. No, they just came, and, but I gave them in the end. That's a nice one. This one. Oh, that's the one. That was the one that was held at me, <laughs> and said, before, "Put it on." Before he slipped. Yeah, that was before the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and that's why I had to wear it because I was now light entertainment. I yes. couldn't be serious anymore. And, and it, did it make a difference, Russell? Did you feel a bit no, more light well, entertainment? No, well, I mean, image is everything, isn't it? But my oh. stars were still dead serious. And in fact, oh. Harry became a very close friend after that. And I went to see him in Pickwick at the Manchester Opera House. No wonder, because you'd saved him from the slippery sofa. I know, from the slippery <laughs> slope. <laughs> yeah. Debbie, what do you remember about that... Uh, that job you had because you were very much news weren't you, you no jumpers news, yeah. for you no jumpers for me no in fact i did the first show wearing we had no dress designers or anything in those days that we were left changed. to our own <laughs> no you <laughs> still don't well you're looking very elegant today i have to say so I, I think we girls can choose our own clothes but i did buy i had this weird outfit which i think i got in a sale you know and it was like cream a skirt and a cream top and i people kept saying she looks like a bride and it was <laughs> i realized i was wearing completely the wrong thing and yeah. um it yes i mean i'd been a researcher before that and Goodness. oh there as i am by magic a tiny frightened rabbit of a person staring you into space. do not look frightened. Well, it is a miracle that I didn't. I think it must have been the kind of confidence of youth or something, because I'm sure I didn't know what the hell I was doing, really. I had absolutely no training. 
I literally got plucked out of research. Uh, I applied for a job as a reporter and uh, Ron Neal rang me one day and said, um, I'd like you to come and audition as a newsreader. And I sort of literally almost said, I don't want to be a newsreader. But I said, oh, right then. So I bibbled along, did an audition, <laughs> came home and thought, I don't think I was very good. And I think I would quite like to be a newsreader, actually. And my boyfriend, now my husband, was a producer at the time. And he said, well, sit on the sofa and I'll, you know, he wrote some stuff and I practised to him. And he's going, no, no, more emphasis on that word, not this word. And then I rang them up and said, can I have another go? And they said, go on then. And, um, and then I got the job. There were about 4,000 people applying for it, which I didn't know at the time. And That's I had fantastic. no idea. That's because Ron, you see, is behind every story. Have you noticed? Yeah. I've noticed. Wonderful Ron Neal. And so he, we were shape shifters to him. I suddenly went from news and current affairs to light entertainment. Debbie went from researcher to news. Well, I think he So always, we all moved yeah. around, he which is wonderful. He employed me, he said, because, well, partly, obviously, I suppose, that the serious side was he liked the voice. But I think also because I was Scottish. And I told him that my grandfather was from Peterhead and he said, said, Peter Heed, as they say, and he'd say, right, we're having her, you know, it's the <laughs> Scottish cabal, really. We're going to hear from Ron Neal, the man, oh, the first boss of breakfast time, a little bit man. later in the programme. And of course, as far as the astrology was concerned, that was controversial, wasn't it? Some people said this should not be on television, Absolutely. certainly not on a news programme. Fabulously controversial. Brilliant. Um, it was Alistair Milne, the man at the top at the time. Another he Scott. said, if you have an astrology slot, there needs to be a God slot too. And... Um, Ron basically stuck by me and said we need astrology because he had this whole idea, the whole project really was a Daily Mirror or Daily Express of the morning. And now I write stars for them both. So thanks to Ron, I now do both the Express and the Mirror. Some things never change. Here's to you, Ron. <laughs> we love you. We love I Ron. bet you he's watching. <laughs> Stay with us because we've got lots more to talk about on the programme. Debbie and Russell, of course, were, were on screen, but there are lots of brilliant people who've worked on this programme behind the cameras who are absolutely crucial to those 40 years. Yes, some have moved on, but others have been with us from the very start. This is Bernie Wingfield. Morning, Bernie. I know he won't like this. One of our technical operators who worked on our very first show in London in the sets and props department and is still working on the programme today. He's taken the day off. Because he wants to watch, not work on it, I suspect. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie, for everything you've done over 40 years. Ironically, for a sound man, he didn't want to say anything no, in public. <laughs> but I know what you're thinking, Bernie. <laughs> of course, it wasn't just news on that very first programme, as we've been hearing. The show also had its resident fitness guru, the Green Goddess. Real name, Diana Moran. And that morning she was at Waterloo Station getting all the commuters uh, with their brollies uh, to do an aerobics routine. And guess what? Guess, guess what? We have sent Jane McCubbin back there with the green goddess herself. Morning, both. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. And the legend that is the green goddess is in the house. Oh. Round, of thank you, thank you. Round of applause. You remember that moment well. I certainly remember 40 years ago on this spot. <laughs> And it was even more cold than this. Oh. And I was in a green leotard and tights. <laughs> and you still look just as fantastic. You're very kind. You started that morning with a few words, which were? I said, come on, Britain, get up, wake up, and get fit. Yes. And that's what we're going to do this morning. That is get what we're going to do this yes. morning. Yes, yes, yes. Before we show you, that moment oh, from no. way back when before we show you i just want to chat to some of the people here good morning everybody morning. good morning thank you for stopping commuters you're all wonderful marjorie you remember don't you you take me back <laughs> 1983 early mornings <laughs> morning getting ready for work and thinking i must i must do that i must get time to do that and then shooting off and not quite managing <laughs> i'll do the, it next time the will was there <laughs> but <laughs> really no simon let me bring simon and eric over come on over guys john you remember too come on <laughs> wasn't diana a vision was wasn't she she still is she still is a vision oh, yes she still 
here yes, for vision. You're absolutely, absolutely right. Awesome. Yeah, I can remember. First of all, I remember the logo, which I think you've got there. Yep. That seemed really modern at the time. And the other thing I remember is everyone was so casually dressed. <laughs> and I thought that was a, that was a weird thing. Uh, but of course, uh, when we were told we were going to see the Green Goddess, I was thinking because I'm colourblind, I, I didn't know she was <laughs> actually green, but I could certainly see why she was and still is a goddess. Fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. John, don't you? I do. Right. It was very early in the morning for a teenage boy and I had to take a double take. I thought it might be, it might be my mum. <laughs> and she was a beautiful lady, so uh, full credit to you. Shall we go back? Let's yes. go back, shall we? Have a look at this. 40 oh years ago, word. today from this very spot. Take oh. a look. It's cold. It's dark. It's a bit miserable. But come on, Britain. Wake up. Shape up. And stretch up. Let's get Britain fit. Take your shoes off. A gentleman, under your coats, make yourselves feel comfortable, put your papers down and your pipes and your umbrellas, and let's all of us get fit. Britain is going to show a leg and stretch this morning. out expanding the lungs and then down we go again and, and stretch any of the British Rail like to come and join us as well stretch in the morning anyhow let's put that to music because keep fit should be fun up and stretch out down again right down stretch up and out now sir right down this time well done Stretch. Uh, uh, I call this the monkey. Uh, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Anybody else like to join us? Come on in and join us. Anybody over here? Come on, sir. Come and join us. You young man. You always got the music. Okay. Not yet. Well, we've hustled up a crowd. Thank you, crowd, for stopping. Look at them. Come on over. Don't be shy, people. Come on over. I think we're ready. Commuters, are we ready? Yes! Diana, are we ready? Oh, I'm ready. Are Take you ready? <laughs> Good. Take let's it away, get... Green Goddess. Oh, I think let's, first of all, get rid of the, the cares of the world. Let's have some music. So, feet a little bit apart and lift the shoulders. Lift, lift, that's it, good, good. And roll the shoulders. Really work your back and your chest. Oh, that's really good. And stretch, stretch, that's it, good. That's it, wake up the body. Let's get Britain fit. And to the sides. Over you go. Excellent. And a little bit further down. Good. Good. Up again. Over to the sides. And up to the top again. That's a lovely workout. Now, what I want you to do is feet a little bit apart. I want you to do the monkey stretch. So down you go and up you go and stretch. Let's do one more. Down you go, up you go and stretch. And another one. Down you go, up you come and stretch. Are you feeling fit? How is it? Absolutely you. brilliant. Thank you. Diana Moran, you were a legend then and you are still a legend today. Oh, you're very, you very sweet. You have transformed the face, not just of breakfast television, but of keep fit across the nation. Well, the thing is to keep active through your life. Keep active, keep moving. Into older age, you're never too old. 83 to keep yourselves fit. Round of applause! Round of applause!
God, it's been so lovely having you with us this morning. Thank you so much. I love being here. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Back to you guys. Thank you so much, Diana Moran. Woo! Yay! Tell you what. Absolutely great. Icon. Whatever Diana is on, I'll have it. Because <laughs> we'll all she have is some. incredible. Keep moving, that's what she says. Love it, love it. There's more as well, more nostalgia, because 40 years ago today, the weather looked very different. Carol's here this morning, and she's got a, a bit of a retro forecast. Good morning, Good loving the jumper. Good morning, I didn't check the jumper, but check out Mr. Francis Wilson. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Original weatherman on breakfast time. Francis, we're wearing these jumpers for a reason. Viewers used to send them to you, didn't they? Yeah, well, we had a kind of a soft, friendly image, and so we got viewers to have a competition who could bet knit, best knit a jumper, and that was the winner you're wearing. It's so, very nice. Yeah, and we had but a stack of them, and this is another one. Yours is very nice too, nice and weathery. But what was it like being on the programme day one? A whole new, new regime, if you like. What was it like? Were you nervous? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, we... we we were trying to be relaxed and cosy with the sofa, and you've heard um, um, Debbie and Russell sort of like bookends talking as uh, friends, and they had the time of their lives, as in fact we all did in the end. But to begin with, the weather was um, a little bit different because we, we were trying to blaze a trail, and first of all, we needed pictures to be in the studio. So real pictures, not the um, colour separation overlay that most people do, where it's a blank wall, but real pictures. So a guest could come across from the sofa and just muck about with the weather, because it's really here, you can see it, and they'll talk Gosh, about Francis, it. Francis, thank goodness they don't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> That's wrong. Well, yeah, Pamela Stevenson really kind of got at me, and uh, Lenny Henry, of course, and they all made, a uh, comedians make a joke of it, which yeah. is, you know, it's quite fun. Well, let me, let me run the graphics. If I get out of the way, and you can talk us through them. Well, the thing is that um, we, we, we went in for movies because it's telly, so we needed to begin with what's been happening to the weather. And we did that from Meteosat uh, launched into space and, and, and it was a weather satellite sending us images all the time. So we stacked the images up and flicked through them. And it was the first go at a sort of a movie and that set up what had been happening. And then we needed to get into the forecast, which was done on a paint box. This is a paint box chart. These are the kind of significant areas. And the paint box would have the advantage of being done very quickly. You know how we used to stick uh, magnetic symbols on magnetic boards? But now a, a graphics artist could just take a symbol and stick it anywhere very quickly and do lots of these charts. So the charts were for, say, midday, at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, something like that. But, well, for today, what would happen was, we can't see it on this, this particular stack, but we've got, this is the weather area. So, the cold Arctic air that's coming down here is um, unstable because the water here, which doesn't change much in temperature, is about six or seven. So, the white thermals are bubbling up all the time, and that produces snow clouds, which come all the way down to here because it's so cold, the air. Um, here in Manchester, Liverpool, and going down towards Birmingham, there are frequent snow showers, um, hail, sleet, and so on. One or two will get to Birmingham, but most of them are in the Cheshire Gap between the hills of Wales and over here in uh, Manchester. And then there's some remnants and fluffy bits get down to London, and that's about it. So most people will actually have a very bright, sunny day. And I love the way that you said fluffy bits there, because it, it actually ties in with this jumper. Yeah, that was a nice sort of signature at the bottom. So. so how different it is now, because now we have fly-through graphics, we have 3D graphics. It's come a long way. It has come a long way. Yeah. And you, tell us a bit about how you used to get your information, Francis. Well, at three o'clock in the morning is very difficult, and that was the time to get up. But I had to be on the roof at Imperial College at four o'clock in the morning. So the thermal infrared images that were coming down from the satellite would be stacked up and I'd take them away on a tape and then we'd show them as a movie. So there was that to do. But then after that, the forecast, the products come from the Met Office and it usually came as a, a series of advanced looking charts that where all the weather elements were in time. So then I had to draw that out in pencil for the graphics artists so that they knew where to put the weather and what weather we were talking about. Gosh, Give them a stack so of paper. Different. And this was all happening when it was dark outside yes. and cold. You used to yeah. run up a fire escape on the outside of the building to avoid the crowd inside and get all the charts to the um, 
graphics people the and also the videotape had to be updated through the program because it goes on for a long time the program and i hate to interrupt you which is running out of time but you are an inspiration i think another big round of yeah. applause for mr Absolutely. francis wilson well it's just you. doing my job oh, thank, thank you, you very so much, much both of you. don't go anywhere we need you on the sofa in just a moment you're back doing the timings again aren't you you're back with your stopwatches <laughs> Carol, thank you very much indeed. 40 years on, the weather still pants, basically, isn't it? Yes, yes. The again. weather itself, not the weather forecast yet. Now, when the programme first started, the idea of morning television was really controversial. TV was seen as something you watched in the evening. Yeah, but our media and arts correspondent David Silito has been taking a look at the battle to get breakfast telly on air first. Television on in the morning? That's disgusting. It was an adventure in television. It was doing something absolutely new. 6.30, Monday, January the 17th, 1983. Gosh, it was frightening. The very first edition, the first yes. programme. Quite a few minutes before... Meet Ron and Keith, editor and director of day one of BBC Breakfast Time. And this was more than just a new programme, it was a new idea. We've only been going for about a minute. <laughs> People were doubtful, weren't they, about breakfast television at the time. People said, television on in the morning? That's disgusting. Disgusting idea. What's happening in this country? People even used the word immoral. Some people say, immoral that you would have the television on in the morning. We're far too busy uh, getting ready for the working day ahead. We listen to the wireless in the morning. showers, chiefly in the north and east, rather windy. Indeed, the BBC's first experiment with breakfast television had been to simply stick some cameras into a radio studio. It's seven o'clock on Monday, the 1st of December. This is Radio Vision. And it wasn't the TV so gold they were hoping for. The director of education, Ronald MacDonald, knows it won't be an easy job. It will require, in the limited time available to the end of this financial year... However, everything changed when a certain rival broadcaster made an announcement. One bright day, ITV announced it was going to do breakfast television, and that day onwards, the BBC was going to do it, and boy, it had to be on the air first, they said. So, that was how we started. And just look at the coverage this race generated in the papers, and even 40 years on, some of the stars of TVAM's roster of presenters, the famous five, haven't entirely forgiven the BBC for sneaking in ahead of them. As you know, the BBC went on, in fact, before we did, so there was a, there was a certain amount of, um, of sort of um, being a bit cross about it. But at the same time, we'd seen what the BBC were doing and um, the people that put together what we did on TVAM was quite different. So it was a challenge. <laughs> A challenge TVAM met with a certain degree of serious suited formality. Hello, good morning if you've just joined us. It's just after six on Tuesday the 1st of February. We're going to bring order to the weather today, David. Thank you very much indeed. It was a tense, competitive atmosphere and the BBC was a bit of an underdog, but it had a secret weapon. And for an organisation that is very jacket and tie, it can be perhaps best summed up in one word. Jumpers. Now, as you can see, our home is very, very relaxed and informal, and we really do think that that is the right setting from which to bring you interviews with people and personalities who are making the day's news. Jumpers. Yes. I'm not sure that we said to Frank, wear a jumper. I think Frank just decided to put on a jumper. I'm sure there was disapproval. Oh, I'm sure there was, because people have an expectation. You know, this is a news programme, it's the BBC, therefore it will be formal, there will be you know, ties and jackets and, and all of that, and it will be behind a desk. Yes, no desk, a sofa, a sofa that Keith bought from Harrods, all part of his plan. So what feel were you trying to create? It needed to be very friendly, very cosy. Now, who did everyone think was going to win, BBC or ITV, when it came to ratings? The BBC was not expected to win this battle, and it won hands down. Well, the largest <laughs> bottle of champagne in the world. <laughs> and and at the end of the first programme, your feelings? Relief. 
The first program ended with uh, champagne being uh, opened. You've uh, upstaged. Oh, oh my giddy <laughs> eye! <laughs> You'll never work again. So, explosive champagne at the BBC. <laughs> and at TV AM, there were a few dramas. The format just wasn't a hit with viewers, but the people who paid the price were the two female presenters. Oh my gosh, it was, um, what is it the Chinese used to say? We lived in interesting times. <laughs> Have you ever told the full story? No, um, I haven't, and neither has Anna, because we were the two, if you like, um, sacrificial lambs when TVAM went completely off the rails but it, it was also very exciting of course it was nobody had done breakfast television before <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile for Ron and Keith on this look back at what they created is there something of their program in today's breakfast no desks uh, a relaxed chat between presenters yeah, there's still quite a bit of that there. And the weather's done brilliantly, of course, and so are other things. So although it's a much more newsy programme now, it still has that feeling of, good morning, you're welcome, come in and we'll hope give you a decent start to the day. <laughs> Tell me about the cake. So, much has changed, but the sofas, friendly informality, the formula was there on day one. You've been uh, watching the first edition of BBC Television's Breakfast Time. <laughs> David Siletto, BBC News. <laughs>Forty years on. Look who's here! <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Nagar and Charlie are here. This is weird, isn't it? Is it? All bit... four of us on the sofa together. Oh, I know. Is that allowed? Uh, it I... is now. It's like some Doctor Who thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys from the original programme all still here. It's great Amazingly. to have... Amazingly. Yeah. Amazingly. Yeah. I don't mean still here, still here. I mean still no. here. We're just on the yeah, programme. <laughs> Yeah. 40 years, hey? I mean, I, uh, well, I guess when you watch back that first edition, yeah. how has the programme changed and not changed? Debbie? Careful <laughs> what you say now. I'm terrified <laughs> now, don't yeah. ask me. Well, I think, you know, we were, you have been encouraged to become more focused in your, it's more newsy and current affairsy, isn't it? I mean, there's no doubt about it because there's no green goddess, there's no Francis with his completely non-existent weather maps, <laughs> but, you know, basically it's raining. Well, we um, started, there was not many right? people, but if uh, we yeah, got no, a big audience and when you get a big audience, you change your mind. Oh, we're appealing to so many people, we better smarten ourselves up. Yes, and I so think, we went from jumpers yeah, yeah. to suits. Yes, I think, uh, but you know, it's essentially doing the same job, isn't it? It's telling people the agenda, giving, setting the news agenda for the day, and that's what breakfast television is about, really, isn't and it? And how important is it, or was it then, do you think that everybody felt, I don't know, like they could put their TV on, and it was like their extended family? Well, I think that was a part of it, and I think the jumpers all helped, you know, the no and the sofa. And, 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 and there weren't that many channels, and there was no social media, yes. Yes. so we became, well, we had, such loyal yeah. fans out there. I mean, I used to get about a thousand letters every week because we did a starlets of the day where I used to read up people's birthdays and a, and a horoscope. And we got, I mean, there was that many people because that was the only way they could contact us. And that was through actually writing yeah. a letter or sending a postcard. Talking to the jumpers, I don't know how you did it because I've only had this one on for about 10 minutes and I'm melting. <laughs> it's <laughs> really hot. hot. It's like, what, what are you guys, what are your first memories of breakfast telly, you two? Hey, oh, I can't. <laughs> it was, a, right, to I can't honest, it, it was a bit of a blur time for me because I was, uh, I was just, I was at college then. Okay. Frankly, it came and came and went and I didn't know. <laughs> if I'm absolutely honest, the launch of BBC Breakfast, because I was like, what is I? Tw I was 20 years old. You were so asleep. So I wasn't yeah. up much in the morning, is the honest truth. No. I think yeah. I was never organised enough to even have the telly on. I'd just be rushing to school. Really? Late? Yeah. Late? late. 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 Running with your satchel. <laughs> <laughs> My little trumpet <laughs> and whatever, quite a lot yeah. of interest in the other side also being on at the same time. And so yeah. there's a rivalry. So people would always take an interest in that and who's yes. left what and who's Oh, that's all changed, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all completely Oh my goodness, is there watching, another side? Yeah. Another side? <laughs> and, it, and it's still the same, isn't it? Um, also, the thing that fascinates me is, you know, we here, we're connected to the internet, we have people chatting in our ears all the time, we have everything at our fingertips. But 
it was more basic for you in those days. How did you get the news? Have you had well, breaking news? What happened? That I have got two little stories which I will try and truncate because it's otherwise I'll be here for half an hour. <laughs> I mean, as you know, reading autocue as a newsreader is actually quite dull. You know, you basically chunter away, do your thing, and then you get <laughs> off. But when you, when the, when the, I can't say this, but I must say this politely, but when, when it all goes wrong, yes, that's when you uh, earn your money. And we did have two stories. We had the death of Indira Gandhi, uh, and we had the Brighton bomb. And the Brighton bomb, we broke the news of the Brighton bomb, and I had somebody in my, my news editor in my ear. We had no scripts, nothing. We just had footage of people like Michael, uh, Norman Tebbit being brought out of the wreckage. And my editor, who was another Scotsman, swearing and shouting i won't say what he said but it, you know then you have to translate it into something like a newsreader you know yes so that was good we got accommodation from alistair milne for that and then two weeks later virtually indira gandhi died and the stringer we usually used was up country we had a, an unknown stringer the same scottish news editor went to the satellite feed to wait for the news to come in and forgot that he had a newsreader sitting in the booth waiting to speak oh. and there was nothing happening. I was literally sitting there with no script, nothing. I'm pressing my little button under the desk. That's like a stress dream. Waiting for somebody and eventually somebody said to me, junk everything, move to Poland. And it was like, <laughs> OK, as you can be sure, we're having <laughs> yes. some terrible troubles trying you, to get You know day. who was doing the autocue in those early days? <laughs> Carol! <laughs> yeah, where were you, Carol? You really let me down that day. Why are you Why yes. didn't we know this? No. Oh, you did. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, guys, we have to junk everything. We're not going to Poland. We're going to cake. Cake? Oh, We've got yeah. cake. Can I introduce Ooh. Tracy, our brilliant floor manager, oh, oh, bringing oh, in Tracy. Morning Tracy. Tracy. Looks oh, after us every Tracy. day. Tracy and I go back years. Yes. And this Ooh. was made by <laughs> our fantastic <laughs> producer, Abby Smitten, as well. Look Aww, at that. Amazing. Amazing. that is. We have the original logo on a cake. Well I done, Abby. The original Who's television it? Who's cut <laughs> it? Who's yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's, no, we're not allowed <laughs> enough. They know us too well. <laughs> <laughs> no knives on set. We're just going to do it with hands. We're all going to just plough in. OK, thank you so much for joining oh, us this amazing. morning. A special 40th anniversary edition of Breakfast. Now it's time for Morning Live. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>